I get it.
inside the wood because we're um, shrinking. Yeah. Teaching my mum was butting in. <laughs> I was like, just because we're not all sitting next to you doesn't mean it was just easy, public it? speaking. <laughs>
actually see it? On which one? No, that one. I think it's that one. Is it that one? That one over there. Yeah. <laughs> and I can, yeah, I'll just wait. Which one is it? Oh, this one. Brothers and sisters, we believe that all the ties of friendship and affection which knit us together as one throughout our lives do not unravel with death. Confident that God always remembers the good we have done and forgives our sins, let us pray, asking God to gather Roger to himself. O God, to whom mercy and forgiveness belong, Hear our prayers on behalf of your servant Roger, whom you've called out of this one. And because he put his hope and trust in you, command that he be carried safely home to heaven and come to enjoy your eternal reward. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Please sit down. Our first reading is a reading from the book of Revelation. I, John, saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had disappeared now, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, as beautiful as a bride, all dressed for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice call from the throne, You see this city? Here God lives among men. He will make his home among them. They shall be his people, and he will be their God. His name is God with them. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death and no more mourning or sadness. The world of the past has gone. Then the one sitting on the throne spoke. Now I am making the whole of creation new, he said. I will give water from the well of life, free to anybody who is thirsty. It is the rightful inheritance of the one who proves victorious. I will be his God, and he a son to me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join together in the responsorial psalm from our leaflet. The response is, the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures where he gives me repose. Near restful waters he leads me to revive my drooping spirit. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. He guides me along the right path. He is true to his name. If I should walk in the valley of darkness, no evil would I fear. You are there with your crook and your staff. With these you give me comfort. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. You have prepared a banquet for me in the sight of my foes. My head you have anointed with oil, my cup is overflowing. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Surely, goodness and kindness shall follow me all the days of my life. In the Lord's own house shall I dwell for ever and ever. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Our Gospel reading is from St. John. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God still, and trust in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house. If there were not, I should have told you. I am going now to prepare a place for you, and after I have gone and prepared you a place, I shall return to take you with me, so that where I am, you may be too. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, I didn't have the privilege of knowing Roger James personally. He'd only been in Helston, as you know, a few months, and during that time, visits to nursing homes were prohibited. But I'm looking forward to reading the eulogy later. We had a bit of um, concern about that, but it, it is here and present, and so I can read it later, and I'll, I'll look forward to that. Um, we're reading it because we thought everybody here, first of all, everybody would know all about him. Then we decided we're, we're streaming this and recording it for friends far and wide, and they may not know everything about him. I know from personal experience it is always gratifying to hear people from outside the family say good things about your parents. We always know how good and loving and they are, but it's always nice to have that confirmed, especially by other people. And in that Gospel reading we heard, Jesus was speaking to his friends. My own father was a postman, and so I know how many different sorts of people from a great variety of different backgrounds 
you meet in that kind of work. And it was the same for the people Jesus was talking to. Some were fishermen, some were civil servants, some were laborers, some were traders. But they all had one thing in common. They were anxious about what would happen to them after they died. Which is why Jesus made that speech we've just heard to reassure them and to take away their fears. And I believe what was true for those first disciples is also true for many of us today. Regardless of our background or our occupation, we all know that there's nothing more certain than just as we were born into this world, so one day we know we shall have to leave it. We don't know the when. It may be many, many years from now. It may be tomorrow. That bit we don't know. But especially when we're confronted by a funeral, we are reminded that that day will inevitably come for us. And it can make us just a bit anxious, as it made those first disciples of Jesus in that Gospel reading. But that same passage will also take away our fears, just as it did those of those who were the first to hear it. Because I always think we're most frightened by the unknown. If the makers of horror movies really want to scare us, they leave the terror in the shadows, so that we can't really see what it's like. We don't really know what we're facing. Once we do, once we can see it and face it, it does lose a lot of its scariness. And it's the same with death. If we don't know what's waiting for us, we can be really frightened by it. Once we do know what's there, then we lose a lot of that fear. And this reading tells us exactly what we have to look forward to, that there is a room for us in our Father's house, that where Jesus went after he died, there we have a home waiting for us as well. And we know that after his death, Jesus went to be with his Father in heaven. And so we can be assured that for his friends, there is a home waiting there for us as well. But losing our own fear of death won't take away the sadness, the loss that you feel for someone who was important in your life. Because every parting from someone that we've loved is bound to be sad. But we can't really be sorry that someone we were so fond of is now in a better place. Free from all those worries and cares of this life, from, free from all the aches and pains that come to all of us as we get older and older. You will all have very different memories of Roger Day. Today I want to encourage you to share those memories with one another, to thank God for all that Roger meant to you, to look forward to that day when you will once again share his company, just as even now we believe he's gone to join his wife, who sadly only died earlier this year, his other son, and all those he knew and loved and who were waiting to welcome him as he makes his way to his eternal hope. So let us bow our heads in prayer for Roger. God, our Almighty Father, you raised Christ your Son from the dead. With confidence in him we ask that you save all your people, living and departed. And we pray for Roger, who in baptism was given the pledge of eternal life that he may now be admitted to the company of the saints. For our brother who ate the body of Christ, the bread of life, that he may be raised up on the last day. For all our deceased relatives and friends, and for all who have helped us, that they may have the reward of their goodness. For those who have fallen asleep in the hope of rising again, that they may see God face to face. For the family and friends of our brother Roger, that they may be consoled in their grief by the Lord, who wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. 
and for all of us assembled here to worship in faith, that we may be gathered together again in God's kingdom. Longing for the coming of the kingdom, we pray together in the words that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now friends, we're going to listen to a recording. It's a poem, It Is Only We Who Grieve, which has been recorded by Sarah. As we listen to it, I'm going to ask Gary if he would help me get the eulogy ready. It is only we who grieve. They do not grieve. They are not gone. They look upon us still. They walk among the valley now. They stride upon the hill. Their smile is in the summer sky. Their grace is in the breeze. Their memories whisper in the grass. Their calm is in the trees. Their light is in the winter snow. Their tears are in the rain. Their memory runs in the brook. Their laughter in the lane. Their gentleness is in the flowers, they sigh in the autumn leaves, they do not leave, they are not gone. It is only we who grieve. If only we could see the splendor of the land to which our loved ones are called for me and you, you'd understand. If only we could hear the welcome they receive from all the familiar voices all so dear, we would not grieve. If only we could know the reason why they went, we smile and wipe away the tears that flow. Wait, content. There are times when we're grateful for modern technology and times when it makes us annoyed. Today is one of those times we're grateful. Roger James. Roger Frank James was born in June 1926 at Station Road, Portsmouth. The parents, Eva Daisy and Francis James. He grew up in Portsmouth, but in the 30s Depression period, his family moved 14 times to find work in the area, and for a brief time they lived in Weymouth. During the outbreak of World War II, their home and contents were lost to a bombing raid, and his parents moved him to his mother's home village of Lilliput at Sandbanks in Dorset where he lived with his auntie and uncle for a brief period before moving back to Portsmouth. On his return, he entered Portsmouth Dockyard as an electrical apprentice, which would take the next six years to complete. During his time in the dockyard, he worked mainly on aircraft carriers, but later found his skills better suited by working in the dockyard generating station. This station could also supply the city of Portsmouth if required. Once qualified, he moved into the drawing office as a draftsman in the dockyard. During the same period, he found great interest in playing the drums, being influenced by the big band music of the time. He also used to sneak off to watch the Royal Marine Band practicing at Eastley Barracks. Getting to know the bandsman led him to being taught to play the drums by members of the Marine Band in the evening, which was always a giveaway to other drummers by the way he held his sticks. These lessons, although very disciplined, were charged at the rate of one pint of beer per lesson. Once old enough, he then took to playing in the youth clubs of Portsmouth with fellow musicians who were also dockyard apprentices. In 1948, Roger's cousin Lavinia suggested he travel to London to meet her work colleague Betty Berry on a blind date weekend. They met under the clock at Waterloo Station, and after many miles spent travelling between London and Portsmouth, they were married in St Cecilia's Hogan in 1951. Betty and Roger moved into a flat in the Fratton area of Portsmouth, 
which had the Portsmouth Main Line Railway at the bottom of the rear garden, and a bus stand on the opposite side of the road. Betty wasn't sure why Roger picked this location, but she soon came to discover the reason, as most of you will also know. They both continued to work in the dockyard until in 1953, when Betty left and their first son, Alan, was born. Soon after, in 55, Roger was moved by the MOD to Bath, where their second son, Trevor, was born, and they continued to live in Bath until 1987. After the sad passing of their son, Alan, Roger and Betty took up interest in many local amateur music groups, putting on shows around the Bath area. Roger played the drums for around eight amateur musical groups, including all the Bath gang shows and musical taverns for the stage club. In 1987, Roger and Betty retired and moved to Wimborne, where they spent 33 happy years touring the garden centres and coffee shops when the bus's new sheet would allow. Roger and Betty were great supporters of the Catholic Church wherever they lived and took great strength from it. They also enjoyed the friendly, supportive community it generated, taking part in many fundraising events. They also gave back a bit more of that support in many ways, including befriending many elderly people in local homes, visiting them just for a chat, or taking them out to more coffee shops. <laughs> Do you like me to read the buses bit? Right, buses. Most of you will be very aware of Roger's interest and immense knowledge of buses in the UK. In 1994, the PSV Circle was formed and Roger joined as member number 27, of which there are actually over 7,000 members today. The PSV Circle gather information on all aspects of bus and coach operations in the UK and his membership required an immense amount of writing out bus details per month for publishing into a newsletter before email and internet. Roger, over the years, moved to being the editor for the UK South and finally ending up as editor for the entire UK. Everything came to a halt at home the week before the news sheet had to be posted as nothing, not even a power cut, would prevent him from sitting there writing away every night for the best part of a week, producing some 60 pages a month. He slightly reduced the workflow for the BSP circle in 2002, but only in 2012 did he finally give this up as things were moving into the electronic world, and Roger did not enjoy this move, as he couldn't sit in his chair watching TV and writing, although he said he couldn't hear Becky mumbling roomy buses when he was in the other room on the computer. When Betty sadly passed away in July this year, and despite having the best teams of carers anyone could wish for, Roger was unable to stay in Wimborne and was moved down to Godolphin Care Home here in Helston to be near his family. And even while sat out in the front garden, he'd be watching the buses go by and still pass comment on that double-decker shouldn't be on that route. He still continued to receive sheets of bus data while in the home from the South Down Bus Club, sending back corrections to errors he'd spotted. He read endless books on transport over the years, and his vast knowledge even resulted in several books being amended and reprinted due to errors that he had highlighted. His passing was commented on by the PSV Circle members as to the invaluable amount of information he placed into the Circle Library and the loss of his encyclopedic bus knowledge. Roger's finest quality was his patience with everything, an inherent ability to listen, to absorb, and to offer a point of view based on quiet, measured wisdom. It's difficult to imagine him not being around anymore and it will be difficult to cope. His family and friends will miss him dearly. As we gather here today to remember and commemorate his life, let's bid him farewell 
as we mourn the loss of a lovely, dignified soul. A soul that brought joy and fulfilment to men. stand for the commendation. My friend, my brother Roger has fallen asleep in Christ. Confident in our hope of eternal life, let us commend him to the loving mercy of our Father, and let our prayers go with him. He was adopted as God's Son in baptism, and was nourished at the table of the Lord. May he now inherit the promise of eternal life, and take his place at the table of God's children in heaven. Let us pray also on our own behalf, that we who now mourn and are saddened, go forth with our brother to meet the Lord of life, when he appears. Saints of God, come to his aid. Hasten to meet him, angels of the Lord. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. May Christ, who called you, take you to himself. May angels lead you to the bosom of Abraham. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Eternal rest run under him, O Lord. And let the petal light shine upon him. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Into your hands, Father of mercy, we commend our brother Roger in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessing which you bestowed upon Roger in his life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayer. Open the gates of paradise to your servants and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are one with you and our brother forever. We ask this. In peace, let us take Roger to his place of prayer.